Dr. Christopher Rice is the Deputy Director of the Chief of Staff of the Army Strategic Studies Group, and he has served in the Defense Department and the intelligence community in a range of technical leadership roles for 17 years. Prior to joining the SSG, Dr. Rice served as a division head in the U.S. Army Training and Doctrine Command G2, developing long-range assessments of the operational environment, and he served, previously served at the National Counterterrorism Center as the lead strategic assessment officer in the Directorate of Strategic Operational Plans and with the Joint Warfare Analysis Center in a variety of senior scientists and project leader roles, providing direct support to combatant commands. Dr. Rice served 10 years as an infantryman in the United States Army, Army Reserve, and National Guard. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in economics from the University of North Carolina, Asheville, and a PhD in economics from the University of Maryland, College Park. Please welcome Dr. Rice to Mad Scientist. Thank you, Kira. Thanks, everyone. <coughs> Project Cap Arnold, uh, where that name came from, uh, is a meeting with uh, General Milley, our first meeting uh, of the, the new chief of staff with his strategic studies group back in September 2015. Uh, he challenged the group to provide him with a Hap Arnold moment. Uh, this is a, rev a reference to the, uh, the birth of Army aviation uh, in 1911. Uh, the Lieutenant Arnold uh, got instruction in, in, in flying uh, from, from the Wright brothers uh, at a facility in Ohio. And so General Milley is, is interested in thinking about the future in those terms. Okay, what kind of things or ideas, concepts, technologies are just birthing now uh, that will pay off in, in future conflicts you know, 20, 30, 40 years hence? Uh, so when, uh, when my boss, uh, SSG Director Colonel Patrick Mahaney, asked me to brief the conference, he said, you know, let's, let's dig through uh, uh, some of my ideas, some other ideas from other members of the SSG, and, and what are we doing to contribute to, uh, to General Milley's Hap Arnold moment? Uh, this is a new briefing. wanted to keep it exciting, so uh, you're hearing this for the, for the first time. <coughs> uh, several elements that I want to include in here. Uh, Project Hap Arnold is focused on some technologies uh, akin to uh, you know, the birth of Army aviation. Uh, but we want to nest that discussion within a, a broader description of what can we expect in the strategic environment in 2050 and, and operational uh, requirements and conditions in 2050. So with respect to the strategic environment, when we have discussions about the deep future, we typically want to focus on things that are going to change, things that are going to be new and exciting and out there and different. Uh, but I think it's equally important to think about, okay, what kind of things are going to stay the same? Uh, those can be equally important as planning factors for how we design the force, how we prepare for the future. And so looking for something that's going to, to stay the same, you know, one obvious one is geography. Uh, I think it's de rigueur in a, in a briefing uh, like this to, to an army audience to, to quote a, a dead Prussian general, uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to a, a dead English geographer, uh, Sir, Sir Halford Mackinder. <coughs> And in his uh, you know, seminal work, uh, a paper published in 1904, The Geographic Pivot in History, uh, you can see the objectives uh, that he had uh, for this new branch of science, which didn't go by that name then, but eventually came to be called geopolitics. So for the first time, we can perceive something of the real proportions uh, and seek a formula. Okay, so he's looking for, for some kind of, you know, if not mathematical, certainly formulaic expression of, of what the future might hold uh, that will explain things about geographical causation. Okay, so he expected this to, to be able to explain the past and explain the present. And if you're talking about causation, well, you're, you're also trying to explain the future. Uh, over the years, uh, the branch of geopolitics has come in for a lot of criticism since it's often used to talk about uh, armed conflict in the zones and places and conditions when it will occur. Uh, so the certain circles in the academic and political communities think that it's, it's a, a warmongering kind of ideology. Uh, and so at the bottom we see a, a response from Professor Colin Gray to those kinds of crit criticisms of geopolitical thought. Now I would love nothing better than to go through a, a, a in-depth review of, of the history of geopolitics, but that's not what we're about today. So I'll, I'll fast forward as to uh, the post-Cold War, 
post-Cold War world. Uh, Nicholas Spikeman, uh, another uh, famed geopolitical thinker, writing in 1942, is using geopolitics to, to think through what the post-war world will look like. And I'll give you a moment to, just to, to scan there. Uh, and, and this is one reason that I'm interested in, in relying on the discipline of geopolitics to think about the future because in the past it has had useful explanatory power uh, for people to, to think in, in, in a historical situation uh, where the future was very unclear uh, but to draw you know, obvious and compelling insights about the, the future world order. Another more current exponent of geopolitical thought, Dr. George Friedman, the founder of Stratfor uh, and a well-known <coughs> author and blogger, you know, talking about you know, his forecast of the next hundred years of the future, uh, relies on, on the same tradition of thought that Mackinder and, and Spikeman uh, looked at. Uh, the centrality of the Eurasian landmass, uh, the fact that the, the world's you know, center of gravity, political and economic power, uh, resides in Eurasia and that the national security of, of the United States depends on us engaging in offshore balancing, uh, trying to, to, as the British did before us, you know, play off you know, one opponent against another uh, and make sure that no dominant power comes to, uh, uh, to uh, you know, dominate the, the Eurasian continent. And looking at the future, uh, he also anticipates that the smaller conflicts, you know, stabilization operations, will come up unpredictably. Um, so uh, we're not looking here to, to predict where conflict will take place, uh, who it will occur between, where the U.S. will become involved in missions. But we accept that these general class of, of missions will continue to occur. Now, building on uh, some of the things that, uh, that Dr. Moyer shared with us, uh, I'd like to share with you some outputs from <coughs> uh, the, uh, the IFS uh, futures model. And I'm uh, going to show a lot of information to you real quickly, so I'll, I'll explain this graph. Um, this is shown in, in bands uh, at the top. Uh, this will be one year's worth of, of information about the international political order. Uh, country A, uh, the numbers shown to the left there are the percentage of international power uh, that that country possesses. 9% uh, of, the, of the international world order. Country B, 4%. Country C, 24%. And, of course, the, the relative size here is showing their, you know, visually their importance in the international system. So the, the national power index, based on its economic, social, political, military clout, <coughs> is expressed in, in this percentage. The second number in, in the series, uh, 14, 2, and 32, is the percentage of military power that that states possess. So if we compare country A... Uh, to country B, we see a very stark difference in their international political stance. Country A is what we would call militarized. Okay. They're only 9% of, of, uh, of the world's economic, social, political power, but they have 14% of the military power. So this would be a state like uh, a Nazi Germany uh, preparing for World War II, or a state like Israel uh, that's under severe external threats. Country C, uh, in the upper right-hand corner, also shows a predominance of, of military power relative to their economic clout. Uh, and this is a very large number. 32% of the military power in the, in the international system. So this is talking about a, a, a large you know, global power, such as the United Kingdom in the early 20th century or the United States later on. Uh, that's expending a lot of resources to maintain global stability. And finally, in the middle there, country B, uh, this is a country that is, you might call them a free rider on the international system. Uh, this, this might be characteristic of, of many NATO states today. Uh, they are under-resourcing their military relative to their international presence. Uh, the final thing about the graph here that I'll, 
I'll explain, the, the scale uh, across the top and the bottom from negative 10 to positive 10. Uh, this is something called the Polity Index. Uh, it's created by political scientists at the University of Maryland. Uh, at the far left end of the spectrum, negative 10, that's an autocracy, uh, uh, you know, full military dictatorship. At the far end, uh, the right end of the spectrum, it's a full democracy with all the uh, open political and economic institutions that we experience here in the United States. So by way of exp explanation, I, I felt it was important to go through that before I threw the numbers on the screen so, so you can interpret a lot of information very quickly. So again, looking at the discipline of geopolitics and, and how this sorted out at the level of the international political system. Uh, here we see the history of the world from 1900 to 1920 uh, expressed in this format. <coughs> You can see in 1900 that the United Kingdom uh, was the maintainer of, of, of global order. Uh, a lot of resources against their military infrastructure. Uh, you can see in red what at that time was called the, uh, the Triple Alliance uh, of Germany, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Italy. Uh, and in blue, the, the countervailing alliance, uh, the Triple Entente, uh, between the United Kingdom, France, and Russia. You can see the United States, at that point in time, uh, we were one of those free riders on the international system. Uh, our economy and, and other political clout amounted to 23% of international power, but we only accounted for 11% of international military effort. By 1914, uh, the situation had changed dramatically. Italy had dropped out of the Triple Alliance. The Ottoman Empire had joined the alliance of the other central powers. Um, and look at the index numbers there. Uh, you can see a dramatic mobilization by the central powers. Uh, 14, 24, and 4, that adds up to 42% you know, uh, of international military power combined in just those three states. So it's important to remember when we look at projections uh, like Jonathan's of the future and, and international uh, weight in the international system, that it's possible for states to drastically surge with respect to their military capability in a fairly short period of time uh, and present threats to the international order uh, that you wouldn't get out of some linear projection of, of national power. And by 1920, uh, we see the, uh, the post-war order. Uh, the central powers are defeated. Uh, the United States has become a, a dominant military force, uh, but still not uh, exerting as, as much weight in the military arena as its economic and political clout uh, might otherwise indicate. Now let's look at, at a second episode, World War II and the post-war era. Here we can see that uh, the Axis powers, Germany, Japan, and Italy, uh, Germany is rapidly reconstituted after World War I. And again, we can see the dramatic surge of, of military power, uh, you know, Germany really punching above their weight in the international system uh, by engaging in drastic mobilization of military capability. Uh, the UK is still the uh, defender of the status quo, uh, but has been overcome by Germany in terms of military resources. And the United States, you can see the, the dramatic, you know, under preparation uh, for the, the pending conflict. Uh, accounting for only 3% uh, of the world's military capability. Post-war, uh, of course, we all know that the history there. Uh, the, the Axis powers were defeated, and a new Cold War conflict take place. <coughs> and now we, get, we start to see the, the ideological dimensions of you know, the, the world order that, that prevailed for almost 50 years, uh, a concentration of of staunch democracies at the far right end of the spectrum uh, and, and uh, equally dramatic you know, contrast, uh, the autocracies at the other end of the scale. Uh, and moving forward to 1960, uh, we see the evolution of alliance structures, uh, the Warsaw Pact on the left uh, and, and the NATO alliance on the right. And we can see the, the clear uh, predominance of, of economic and military capability that the Western Alliance had. Uh, 
And if we spin that forward uh, uh, to the second half of the 20th century, uh, in the 1980s, you can see a slow erosion uh, of the capabilities of, of the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union. Uh, you can see the results of uh, Nixon and Kissinger's outreach to China. Uh, the Chinese are, are no longer part uh, of that alliance structure. You can see the, the democratic, backslide, dem democratic backsliding of our Pacific allies there uh, in, in Korea and the Philippines. Uh, they dropped out of the, the democracy club for a few years. And then with the, the fall of the Cold War, uh, uh, the, the final ban there in 2000, we see what uh, you know, Fukuyama referred to as the end of history, uh, which in, in this, in this uh, framework uh, is pretty apparent. Gee, there are, there are no uh, autocracies aligned against uh, the West anymore. Uh, democracy, uh, free political and economic institutions have prevailed, and, and things are looking good. And here's the numbers spinning forward. Uh, if we go into the international futures model and, and we project power uh, out to 2050, uh, the, the dramatic geopolitical fact, of course, is, is the rise of, of China, uh, Chinese military power. Uh, still uncertain how, there are, how they will align themselves. Um, and you can also see the, the relative power of, of the, uh, the, the Western alliance. Uh, again, as, as was pointed out to us in the previous briefing, uh, fading dramatically uh, with respect to, to other powers, rising powers in the world. Uh, China first and, and India second. So what do we draw from, from all of this? Um, first off, the, the balance of power in, in the Eurasian landmass, you know, the, the, the center of gravity uh, for the international political order, uh, will still be you know, part of uh, the U.S.'s strategic calculations. We will continue to engage in offshore balancing. We don't know who the adversaries might be. Uh, the, the past 50 years offer a, a hopeful indication that there might not be another world conflict. But the role of deterrence will be essential. Uh, that was the whole point of, of our presence uh, in, in Western Europe for so many years and, and the NATO alliance. Uh, so the Army will continue uh, to be in the mission of deterring or defeating uh, any potential uh, hegemonic adversary. <coughs> Uh, the ground force required for that will be heavy mechanized formations as, as we other, understand them today. Uh, subject to all the technological changes uh, that General Perkins and, and the, the TRADOC G2 and others uh, talk to us about. Um, will the tank become obsolete in the future? I don't know. Uh, there, there will be some offense-defense balance there that, that remains to be sorted out. Uh, and perhaps, perhaps precision attack uh, will make them obsolete or perhaps you know, active protection and, uh, and other technology, technology measures uh, will continue to make them viable. Since this requirement uh, to maintain combined arms maneuver capability uh, cannot be rapidly constituted, this will be a standing mission. The, the United States will have to maintain that heavy force capable of dealing with a pure adversary. And a final principle that we've relied on for a long time is that other missions, uh, we accept risk there. Uh, you don't accept risk in the primary mission. Uh, you can retrain, uh, adapt the force as required for, for the other things the Army may be tasked to do. So let's talk about risk to that mission. Uh, the obvious source of, of number one source of strategic risk is the adversary. You know, that we will be outdeveloped, outthought uh, by, by a capable you know, peer or near peer foe with a superior strategy and force mix. Technology is a source of risk. Uh, you know, General Perkins talked a lot about our ability to, to innovate, uh, you know, whether we can, can maintain the, the speed and tempo of innovation, take advantage of emerging uh, technologies and, and other methods as they uh, appear. Maintaining access to uh, you know, the resources of, of the American people, uh, 
uh, through their elected representatives, uh, maintaining the, the political will and funding uh, to keep that uh, conventional deterrent force in existence. And finally, uh, and, and this is where I want to focus my attention on the, the rest of this briefing, is the demonstrated potential for us to uh, experience strategic failure in COIN missions. Uh, well, let's, let's unpack that one a little more. Here's the, the economic aftermath of, of the Vietnam conflict. Um, of course, U.S. involvement ended in 1973. The, the conflict itself ended with the, the conquest of uh, South Vietnam in 1975. And uh, for the next decade, uh, the United States economy experienced what we referred to as stagflation. Uh, uh, extremely high levels of unemployment uh, that exceeded uh, those that we experienced during the recent recession, combined with uh, intense periods of inflation uh, as high as 13 percent, you know, which had the, the effect of you know, eliminating the, the savings of, of everybody going to retirement during that, uh, that era. And this coincided with a, a dramatic uh, level of spending uh, associated with that conflict, uh, $738 billion uh, by this Congressional Research Service estimate. Uh, which you know, greatly exceeded uh, the amount of spending in, in World War I or World War II or Korea. Economic aftermath of, of our more recent counterinsurgency campaigns. Uh, again, tremendous you know, disruption in the United States labor markets, unemployment rates peaking at 9.6% in 2010. Uh, and we can see what happened to the national public debt during the same period. Uh, more than tripling to over $13 trillion uh, as recently as 2015. <coughs> uh, again, the correct Congressional Research Service uh, talks about the, uh, uh, the financial cost of this conflict, uh, direct cost of $1.6 trillion. Uh, so basically, the United States, you know, one way to think about it is that we borrowed you know, every penny that we spent in these recent conflicts. Let's think about how we wage those conflicts uh, and, and the cost uh, that they generated. Uh, this is just a few shots of basing infrastructure during the Vietnam War. Uh, that's the uh, upper left is a Newport facility in Saigon. Upper right is Cameron Bay. Uh, lower left, the Bien Hoa Air Base, and a, uh, a an evacuation hospital. Uh, forget the location there in the lower right. Uh, the American way of war relies on you know, a tremendous amount of army engineering, um, going in and remaking parts of the host nations in, in the United States image to support the American way of war. This extends into the countryside. Okay. Uh, here we see a, a greater you know, leveling a, a road surface in Vietnam. The upper right, that's an asphalt plant uh, that the army operated. Uh, lower left, we see us uh, uh, clearing vegetation uh, to reduce ambush likelihoods on, on roads in, in South Vietnam. Lower right, we see the, the results of uh, you know, 1960s uh, era IED uh, on Army rolling stock. More recently, uh, we've encountered you know, the, the, the Southwest Asian version of this kind of experience. Uh, the, the challenge of, of maintaining landlines of, of communication uh, in, a, in a hostile, insurgent-filled operational environment. So how do we move past this? Um, uh, this is a technology that is, that is here today in the form of a, a Lockheed Martin developed and now, and now British uh, uh, owned and operated company, the, the Airlander 10. Uh, by 2021, uh, they expect to have something called the Airlander 50 uh, with, uh, as you can see, up to 30 ton payload. Um, <coughs> if we want to get out of the business of 
operating landlines of communication, operating APODs and SPODs, uh, there are potentials. Uh, there's technology out there that will work and there are operational methods we can consider employing. So based on this, this run through, our, our experience uh, of Vietnam uh, and, and Iraq and Afghanistan, in the future, I submit that wide air security operations must be sustainable, uh, politically, financially, and militarily. Um, the, uh, the, the way we wage the, the conflicts in, in Vietnam, uh, Afghanistan, and Iraq had the impact that you saw on public finances, uh, and I don't need to educate this audience on their impact on the Army as well. Uh, after 1973, uh, the Army's readiness uh, was, was in the tank. Uh, it was a, a work of a, of a, of a decade to, to reconstitute the all-volunteer force and reestablish readiness uh, and, a, and a capable deterrent. Uh, in the more recent conflict, uh, we had a, a similar experience, although a more robust force. You know, the all-volunteer force is recovering more quickly, uh, but we've still seen the similar challenges that, hey, what happened to our readiness? Uh, our, our artillerymen forgot how to shoot. Uh, they got to go back and train. We, we got to get back into the NTC uh, and reconstitute uh, that conventional capability. Uh, and what happened external to the United States during those eras? Uh, think back to the late 1970s, uh, leftist insurgencies in Latin America, in South America, in, in Africa. Uh, subsequent to uh, uh, the, the loss in Vietnam, uh, there was a, a demonstration effect, and, and other actors, other similar rivals around the world took that as an opportunity to exploit the situation. Uh, today, what do we see? Well, we see ISIS uh, and, and affiliates. Uh, throughout Southwest Asia and Africa. Uh, we see you know, Russian aggression, opportunism in Georgia and Ukraine. Uh, again, so there are consequences internationally, domestically, uh, all around uh, when we employ our conventional force uh, to wage a, a mission, uh, the wide area security and coin mission that they're not uh, you know, principally dedicated to perform. All of this is by way of, of, of saying that by 2050, submit, we could be doing things differently. Uh, we could adopt these principles for wide area security operations. Uh, like to emphasize number three, uh, the, the formations that conduct wide area security should not be the same formations that conduct combined arms maneuver. Uh, so basically I'm saying that, that Tom Barnett was, was pretty much right about this. Uh, the, those two missions require such specialized skills, even though there, there's over, overlap in, in the, uh, the mission essential task list, uh, that doesn't preclude the fact that <coughs> when you take your, your combined arms maneuver force and apply it to wide area security, uh, you're, you know, you're using your surgical instrument to chop wood. And looking at those financial costs and, and those uh, you know, sustainment challenges that we experienced uh, in, our, in our coin conflicts, uh, we derive other necessary principles of wide area security. Uh, let's get out of the business of, of building APODs and SPODs, S -pods, uh, uh, air, air and sea points of, of, of debarkation. Um, let's get out of the business of, of defending land lines of communication and building a lot of fixed basing infrastructure that the host nation doesn't want and doesn't know how to use and can't afford to maintain. Uh, let's eliminate all of the overhead that we bring to the conflict. You know, the, the 100,000 you know, plus soldiers uh, in Iraq of Afghanistan who weren't actually trigger pullers, who were there just to, to keep the rest of, of the, uh, the real army in the fight. Uh, let's keep all of those folks out of theater. Uh, this implies that those in-theater forces uh, need to be 100% air mobile with organic uh, mobility platforms. And one political corollary uh, to all of this 
is that what we do with respect to the host nation, okay, let, let's, let's take a complete relook uh, at our paradigm there. Um, if you look at the amount of money that we spent trying to, to build uh, Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq, and, and then look at the political consequences uh, of that money, uh, it, it's, it's pretty dramatic. Uh, you look at the corruption index scores for, for Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, since Transparency International started reporting them uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, Afghanistan is perennially number two or number three from the bottom. Uh, out of 180 countries, they'll be number 178. Uh, Iraq is a few notches higher, uh, maybe sixth or seventh from the bottom. Uh, it's an inevitable consequence uh, when you come into, into that kind of uh, society with writing billion dollar checks, what are you doing? You're creating winners and losers. <coughs> uh, you're creating uh, unlimited opportunities for graft and corruption and undermining the very political objectives that you're pursuing, which is to create legitimacy for that host nation government. Uh, so let's rethink that. Uh, now what I'm pre presenting here is not a blueprint for what uh, that concept of operations is. Uh, but I am identifying what I think are, are some clear requirements based on, on our recent historical experience. And finally, getting into the, the Hap Arnold part of the, of the discussion. Uh, let's think about uh, those, those challenges of, of mobility. Uh, we, we looked at a, a few photographs in, indicating the, the operational level problems of, of sustaining you know, conventional force in a coin environment. And if we burrow down to the, to the tactical level, what does that start to look like? Uh, many folks in this room are very familiar uh, with this set of problems. Uh, when, when the United States uh, comes into the neighborhood, uh, as General Perkins says, with, it, with our precision capability and our firepower, and, and the whole panoply of, uh, of tools at our disposal, uh, what does the adversary do? Well, they find places to hide. They find places where they're difficult to get to. Uh, they, they look for mountains, jungles, urban environments, uh, places where our mobility solutions wind up boiling down to you know, a, a squad of, of infantry soldiers uh, with the, the protection and the firepower mobility that they, <coughs> that they carry on their backs. Uh, and by their boots. And, and when they get in those environments, then the adversary has the opportunity to engage us on equal terms. Um, again, this was not a new experience. Uh, we, we have seen this in, in many other conflicts, many other places. Vehicle mobility uh, can also be you know, equally challenging. Uh, conditions of weather, terrain, uh, and, and adversary threat you know, can compromise uh, even the, the most uh, you know, sophisticated and heavily protected platforms. We wind up in a tactical posture where we are you know, forced to, pretend, uh, to protect you know, all of the, the sustainment capability that we string out uh, along the roads and bases behind us uh, as we seek contact with the adversary. Uh, this puts us in a you know, inherently defensive posture, which is not where the Army wants to be. Helicopters provide a lot of relief to these problems, but they come with, with a built-in set of challenges of their own. Uh, perhaps the most prominent is the fact that they are vulnerable to even a lightly armed adversary. Once you get inside the, the threat envelope uh, of their RPGs uh, and other direct fire weapons, so significant challenges uh, to conducting COIN uh, using conventional means uh, as listed here. And our solutions, you know, uh, while valuable and noteworthy, uh, I submit are incremental. Whether we're talking about wheeled, wheeled vehicles, uh, mechanical augmentation, or, or, or future you know, arm fighting vehicles or, or rotor rearing platforms, None of those systems will fundamentally change uh, the, the, com uh, the combat equation, uh, 
uh, in this environment. Even current threat systems will continue uh, to threaten these platforms the same way they do today. So if you're in this kind of situation, is there something else out there? Uh, and I believe there, indeed there is something which, uh, it, it's not out of Star Wars. Uh, it, it actually comes from the UK. Uh, this is a hover bike. Uh, the developer, a uh, young New Zealand engineer named Chris Malloy, uh, was thinking about the problem of cattle ranching in the Australian outback, uh, where you know, the, the cow hands fly helicopters and, and rotor strikes are a big problem. He said, how can I get around this? Well, let me uh, put a couple of protected fans uh, slung on both sides of a motorcycle engine and go flying. I'm not here to sell any particular platform. I am here to talk about a design space, uh, which has emerged in the past decade. Somewhere between the conventional helicopter and the, the, the toy quadcopter that you can buy at, uh, at any hobby store, uh, there is a, a plethora of configurations uh, that are out there for, for small, highly mobile, lightweight VTOL aircraft. Uh, perhaps most in, in intriguing among these uh, is this piece of gear called the Martin Jetpack, uh, developed and sold uh, by a New Zealand company. Uh, using Chinese venture capital. Uh, I have a couple of videos here. I'll show at least one of these. Chip, is this going to work for me or I need to exit? Okay. Well, I want to stay on time here, so I'll describe what, what you would have seen in the video. Uh, is this configuration of the platform being demonstrated to an audience of several thousand people uh, in Shenzhen, China, last December. Uh, it's it's a, an impressive, you know, you know full capability demo. It, it's um, maneuvering very agilely over uh, the, the harbor there in Shenzhen. Uh, and landing on a dais in front of the, uh, the waiting audience. Uh, in the upper right, you can see a more stripped down version where they're, they're trying to, to lighten the, the platform, make it even more capable. Uh, they, all, they have an order book uh, for these, including the uh, emergency fire and rescue services uh, in the United Arab Emirates. And the YouTube link at the bottom, uh, which uh, would also enjoy showing to you at another time, is from 2005. And it shows basically the, the same aircraft, a, a cruder version, uh, flying on an airstrip in Southern California, uh, funded by uh, about a $3 million DARPA grant <coughs> uh, to a small California aviation company. So if we talk about the, the problem of innovation, uh, you know, which, which General Perkins emphasized to us earlier, you know, here can, we can see one indication uh, of the scale of the problem. Uh, we can create a piece of gear just like this one, uh, but when it is confronted with the, the, the institutional hurdles, and FAA regulations, uh, the, the risk aversion of certain parties in, in, in the government, in DOD, uh, or the commercial sector, that idea needs to, to move offshore uh, to get adapted and, and pursued to a commercial solution. But for wide area security operations in the future, uh, we believe uh, this is a place we want to, uh, to, to make some bets. Uh, in, invest in exploratory technologies, uh, development of, of these kinds of uh, augmentations to the basic you know, small VTOL platforms uh, that you've seen in the previous photographs uh, to provide a, a new generation of of uh, wide area security forces, specialized forces, uh, completely air mobile uh, uh, with a, a flexibility 
uh, and lethality and deployability uh, that we've never had before, you know, which can operate at a fraction of the cost and level of effort uh, of our coin campaigns in the past. And I, at that point, I, I will, I will stop and, and call for questions. We have time for one question. Right here. Wow, since I, since I am the one question, I better make it good here. Um, I guess the, the one question I have is when I look at this, it sort of, sort of the historical examples you gave, we had air superiority. What happens when we don't? Because, you know, there's a big concern about anti-access and area denial and all that already. <coughs> uh, the, the types of you know, the mission sets that I'm talking about here uh, are you know, wide area security uh, against the, the class of adversaries uh, that present that, that sort of threat. Uh, if you're talking about a hybrid adversary with conventional capability, uh, then you do need to bring elements of your conventional force. Um, the, that distinction between a CAM force and a, and a WAS force uh, that I talked about, I mean, you can think of them in, in joint terms. If you need to bring both sets of capability to a particular battlefield, uh, then you've got a doctrine for employing them at the same time. Um, but many coin threats, uh, including the ones we, we faced recently, uh, you know, comprise no, no aerial threat uh, to us. Um, uh, the other point about this class of, of platforms is that they you know, physically operate uh, among the ground clutter. Uh, rotor strikes are, are not a threat, so you can get you know, up close to and, and actually touch structures, buildings, whatnot. Uh, so. At the, at the pointy end of the spear, uh, you are not operating up uh, in, in the visible range of your adversary most of the time. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Well done. Oh. Chris, sure. thanks very much. I'd like to thank you for your presentation. I'm not the grand wizard that uh, Mr. Greco is, but certainly like to present you a coin. And thanks for, you know, it's great to see a former Tradotian continuing to challenge the status quo in, in other areas and, and, uh, and, and other avenues. So thanks very much for your thought provoking presentation today. And welcome to the Mad Scientist. And we'll see you someplace soon, see if you have that on your person. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Well, here, here, we're not going to read this again, uh, but on behalf of the Grand Wizard, let me give you your proclamation. <laughs> and again, I will not try to conjure any magic. There's your magic, uh, Mad Scientist coffee mug. Thanks so very thanks much. very much. Thank you.